Hi. <laughs> Hello, reader friends. Hello, reader friends. I feel like it has been forever. <laughs> yeah. When was the last time we did this? Oh God, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. I feel like I've been on other people's channels more than I've been on ours lately. <laughs> we, had, we had a little more chill December, which I think probably everyone could appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sure. we're gonna we're gonna try to also introduce ourselves and be welcoming to people who haven't maybe have been here before. Yes, yes. Do you want to start? Okay, I'm Kateri, and this is Megan. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's all we need. Um, and yeah, so this is the Yang Game Book Club. Welcome, welcome. We are actually discussing our December book today. Boom. And I tried to match it, you guys. Look at and me. I matched it. I didn't. This is not even the close yellow. But I did write yellow. Um, <laughs> Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman, um, yeah. which came so highly recommended by the likes of who may uh, it? Giselle. Giselle Huff mm -hmm. of Fun for Humanity. Yes, um, we love her. She's a hero. Mm -hmm. Andrew Yang. Yes, also another hero, A+. Plus. Mm -hmm. um, and all of you guys, because this is one yeah. of the recommended books that we've had. And um, yeah, we haven't actually done too many like group by popular demand books. We'll hopefully do more of those in 2021. Just kind of worked out that way, really. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're hoping that a lot of you have read this. If you have not read this, that is okay. <laughs> Um, we, we will just be talking about it and, and uh, there's no spoilers for a book like this really even though there's a lot of like bomb drop moments oh, my gosh yeah like I felt like constantly I was that emoji you know yeah constantly. yeah and uh, so we're gonna tell you what this book is and then we're gonna bring on our also our guest yes we have a special guest for you guys but well, real quick we just wanted to I don't know. Give a quick rundown of what the what the book is, just in case you haven't read it or you haven't even heard about it, and you're just here for the ride and to support us. <laughs> Are we in the? I'm gonna read this part, right? Okay. Do you want to yeah. read the first two paragraphs, and I'll read the last? Paragraph. Awesome. Let's do it. If there is one belief that he has united the left and the right, psychologists and philosophers, ancient thinkers and modern ones, it is the tacit assumption that humans are bad. It's a notion that drives newspaper headlines and guides the laws that shape our lives. From the writings of Machiavelli to Hobbes, Freud to Pinker, the roots of this belief have sunk deep into Western thought. Human beings, we're taught, are by nature selfish and governed primarily by self-interest. But what if it isn't true? International bestseller Rutger Bregman provides new perspective on the past 200,000 years of human history, setting out to prove that we are hardwired for kindness, geared toward cooperation rather than competition, and more inclined to trust rather than distrust one another. In fact, this instinct has a firm evolutionary basis going back to the beginning of Homo sapiens. From the real life Lord of the Flies to the solidarity in the aftermath of the Blitz, the hidden flaws in the Stanford prison experiment to the true story of twin brothers on opposite sides who helped Mandela end apartheid. Bregman shows us that believing in human generosity and collaboration isn't merely optimistic, it's realistic. Moreover, it has huge implications for how society functions. When we think the worst of people, it brings out the worst in our politics and economics. But if we believe in the reality of humanity's kindness and altruism, it will form the foundation for achieving true change in society, a case that Bregman makes convincingly with his signature wit, refreshing frankness, and memorable storytelling. That's, That's such a good description. <laughs> so perfect. Okay. <laughs> We had a oh, friend run by. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Phil Hodder's here. Oh, hello, hello. There he is. Okay, well, on that note, let's not waste any more time. Let's bring on our awesome guest. Megan, you do it. Pastor Steven. Hey, hello. Pastor Steve. <laughs> 
I felt like you were doing the dance. So I should come up with something. <laughs> yeah. We do a lot of uh, awkward dances here on Yang Gang Book Club. <laughs> I like the dance. Um, so yeah, super, super excited to talk to you about this book. We know you are definitely a, a fan of the book. Um, yeah. So let's just go right off the bat. Like, what do you think? Are humans good? <laughs> I think so. I and it's funny because I'm I'm a pastor, and one of the things that and he talks about like the church and like religion is one of the culprits of of why everyone thinks of themselves as so bad, you know, um, that we're sinful or that we're evil. I mean, he talks about it throughout the book. You know, and not only religion, though, which I'm great, grateful for a little bit because I was worried at first, like, he's just going to blame the church for everything. But he doesn't. Like, he says mm -hmm. it's it's funny, like, throughout, like, it's the the rationalists and it's the um, the evolutionary thought and, you know, and it's the church. So, but I kept thinking, but God made us good. And, um, you know, it, like, Jesus was the I, from my perspective, right? The perfect human being, not because he was Superman, because he was just a creature, like a normal person. And that's good. So I just loved how he just kept using data throughout the book to show like, I, I, you know, you might not think that human beings are good, but like they do good things. And somehow we've gotten it sort of warped in our minds. The church isn't helping, but I think from my perspective has a lot of good things to say about it. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely noticed that, that he did bring up religion, but in a really respectful way. And yeah. in fact, quoted Jesus a lot towards the end of the yeah. book. I noticed that and uh, I, I kind of liked that. I was like, that's really cool that he's kind of using what, I, you know, my experience that has been kind of used against me when I was in, you know, the church that I grew up in. And I, it was kind of refreshing to be like, no, that's not what Jesus meant. This is what, you know, <laughs> like here is, yeah, it's a radical view of humanity. Um, so yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I definitely did notice that. And I was like, oh, he's actually he's being super respectful and quoting Jesus like a lot. <laughs> well, and, the, and his dad, I think in there it said his dad was a pastor and like, um, but he's like not. Uh, Christian anymore, right? I mean, he's, I mean, for what I understood from the book, I don't know, I've never talked to him, <laughs> but um, but I, so I think he like has a respect for it um, without, you know, um, saying that he's a believer or anything. Like he, he just thinks Jesus had a lot of good things to say. So, yeah, but um, there's a lot more about it than it's not just a religious book or anything, but I yeah. think, I think human beings are good. I think God created us good from my perspective. And I think he proves that even without that belief, even if you don't believe in God, that there's a lot of um, a lot of data <laughs> to show us um, why we should believe that. So yes. So you and the idea is that you and an atheist could sit down and read this book and have a lot of common ground to find. Yeah. And that's what I have experienced in the Yang Gang so much. You know, like on my channel, there's a. I mean, some of the my favorite people are the atheists or um, agnostics because we all just agree on the same humanity first principles. And I think that's really what Bregman is getting at. And that's why I think we can all agree <laughs> or at least, you know, work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we all just take this moment and we get started to, you know, share our general thoughts. So um, it you really kind of already got into some of the things that I was curious about with you, you know, your religious background, reading a book like this, that it does go into some of the religious elements, but just, you know, as a person, as a, in, in your per own personal way, you know, whatever that is to you, um, what was your experience reading the book and like, you know, initial thoughts going in, coming out, how did this like, how did this book affect, you know, your world, world view? Well, first of all, and I was, I, I think I told Megan, um, I listened to it on, here's my book. It's on my phone. I use Audible. <laughs> so I listened to it. I don't actually own the um, hard copy book. So I listen to it all the time. Like when I'm cooking or when I'm walking or putting my kids, um, not putting them to bed, but like when I'm waiting for them to get to bed, I'm always listening to it. And, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to buy it for a long time because 
because of the title, I guess it's like, well, that's not very interesting. Like, oh, it's going to tell about how human beings are nice. Like, that doesn't sound very fun. And he sort of makes that point, you know, that we're kind of uh, what what sells, right? <laughs> it's not the idea that people are good. It's the, you know, the the stories of the murderers or what, what do we see on the news? You know, that it's all the horrible stories. Like he mentioned on there, sorry, I don't mean to throw this, i um, talking about in the book already, but like he mentions that I think it was in the eighties as um, airlines got safer and safer, people were becoming less and less trustful of them because all in the news, it was always about plane crashes. <laughs> um, and that's all that people would hear about. Anyway, um, so, I, when I was listening to it, once I finally decided to read it, I just was blown away. Every time I'd hear it, it was just uplifting. It just, it made me, it kept, it just would put me in a positive mood, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I listened to it all the way through, and then I listened to probably three-fourths of it again. Um, it's a lot easier for me to just find time to listen to something than to read it. Um, mm -hmm. But the stories were so great, and it just really helps me to remember um, and, and he answered so many of the questions I had, like about the Lord of the Flies, you know, and um, even talking about from a religious perspective. And I, I loved all the stories, all the, um, the, the science in it. I don't know. I, I just, I feel like I now have 10, um, what am I looking for? 10 anecdotes or uh, studies that I can back up the fact that people are in general really nice. <laughs> if someone argues with me that they're not, <laughs> yeah. I can say, no, look at this. Yeah. I mean, so the, um, that's a good, yeah. You say people are really nice. I, I'll, I will just throw this quote in there. This is like from the very beginning of the book. Um, this is a book about a radical idea, an idea that's long been known to make rulers nervous, an idea denied by religions and ideologies ignored by the news media and erased from the annals of world history that most people deep down are pretty decent. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's a really good one. Yeah, that kind of sums up, I think, a lot of what you said just there. Um, so, yeah. And I think it was at the beginning of the book, it talks about this realism, about being realistic. And I, since I, I didn't, um, I don't have the book, I can't just write out the quote but it's something like this, because <laughs> I, I pause it and try to write it down really quick. Um, it said, somehow when we see a movie about a murderer who changed their victims to a radiator, this is considered a realistic view of the world. When the truth is um, that people are usually loving and kind, you know, that that's actually the realistic view <laughs> based on the studies, right? Yeah, right. That's great, okay. so. Megan, do you have anything you want to add as far as your overall, you know, tell us if you like the book? And yeah, so I I kept texting Kateri like throughout this whole time and I think I even tweeted it. I was like, basically like the TLDR, two I didn't read version of the book is, I thought history was one way and turns out it's not. <laughs> like that was just over and over again. It's like, oh, history told you this, but actually, <laughs> actually this was like proven not to be true, but we just didn't fix it in the books, or we just continued to let everybody believe that this third thing was true. And it was a lot of those misconceptions or just straight up misinformation um, that fuels a lot of how society functions and how we as humans treat each other is fueled by a lot of these things that either didn't even happen at all or just didn't straight up didn't happen the way we were told that it happened. Um, and so that was just my, I mean, my overall thing from the book was just, you know, <laughs> history. I just, I, do I know anything, you know, yeah. like, do I really know anything? Um, <laughs> and just to throw an example out there, cause this was the one that really, I mean, it's the freshest one in my mind cause I just read it, but also really like hit home was like uh, December 1914. Um, it was during the first world war. And there was just like a whole 
Christmas party happening in the trenches on both sides. And they were just singing songs together and playing soccer and swapping recipes. <laughs> you know, like he was, the English were like, here's some chocolate. And the Germans were like, here's some sauerkraut. And I was like, okay, same thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know, and it, it, they, but nobody hears about this, but he says like, without this happening where these people come together without, you know, um, people in charge telling them what to do without any interference, man's natural, mankind's natural inclination is to make friends and to find that common ground and to come out from out from the trenches and make friends and be together and find that commonality. Um, and he was saying how this essentially led to the treaty. Like there would not have been a treaty had this whole Christmas thing not happened because it was, some of it was several days. Some of it on some fronts lasted weeks. People were not firing at each other. They refused to, or if they did, they'd be like, they would send notes and they're like, Hey, heads up. We're going to come like, hit you but we'll fire into the air okay sound good <laughs> we'll fire above your heads is that okay you know? um so that was just really cool to me how you know it, it's something that they don't tell you about and yet it had a direct effect on leading to the treaty that ended the whole war you know um so that was just something that i was like I was a history minor in college. Like, <laughs> I thought I knew stuff. <laughs> Turns out you don't know anything. <laughs> but it's okay. Like, I'm okay with not knowing anything because in relearning that history, you're like, wow, humans are kind of great. Um, <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> all right. <Yes. laughs> Especially, I think, yeah. And I think this is such a great book to end the year with because this year, mm -hmm. not this year, last year, Huh. last year <laughs> was so hard. And I feel like we were constantly shown images and videos of just the worst of humanity. And it was just being shoved down our throats constantly. Like, this is how terrible we are. Um, you know, and I think that coming towards the end of the year, we, we were kind of like, are humans really good? And I was really struggling with that because I've always thought humans are inherently good, just based on anecdotal evidence of my interactions with people. I was like, yeah, humans are good. <laughs> and usually when people end up being bad, it's because like outside circumstances led, led that for them to like do that bad thing or do that evil thing. And he does go into that too, which we can talk about later. But, you know, it, it, it just kind of like what, you know, what Pastor C was saying is that it kind of makes you feel positive. Like I was reading this book and I felt better. I felt lighter. I was, I felt my like faith in my fellow human beings, like being restored. Um, it's a, it's a very hopeful book. It, it says exactly what it says it's going to do. He says, I'm going to give you a hopeful history. And that's, that's exactly what he does. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. So uh, I agree with so much of what Megan just said. I feel like we should just hop right into our, our next thing, I mean, other than saying that, yeah, I love, I love the book, and it was that total, like, same exact experience for me. Kind of both of you said a lot of things that I agree with. Um, so we're gonna start doing this thing. When I'm, yeah, while I'm saying this, maybe you can yeah. throw up some comments. Mm -hmm. We're definitely, I see actually a lot of amazing comments already. So this is really exciting. Um, so we're gonna, we're, we also like to um, do this in a way where. People who haven't read the book can um, come to the meeting and, and still get something out of it. And so a way that's going to also foster discussion is we're going to go through kind of like a what we learned of the book. Um, so I'm going to shout some things out. You guys in the chat, there's a little bit of a delay, um, but you guys here and you guys in the chat, let's comment on some of these things that we learned from Humankind by Victor Bregman. So... Um, so let's see, starting with veneer theory. We did share a quote on this. Can anyone tell us what you know about veneer theory, whether or not you read the book? It sounds almost made up because I've never, I'd never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that would be helpful if I had the quote. Finding the quote. So it's essentially the idea that underneath this veneer of 
civilization, I guess. It's really like is supposed to be the veneer. Um, underneath that, we are like savages or, you know, um, what, what else would you say? Like we are, we, we will devolve into chaos. Yeah, like pull, like pull back the, scratch away the surface and at the, at the, you know, underneath the, that veneer is like a terrible society, a terrible humanity, a terrible everything. Everything's terrible, essentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this book essentially goes into why that's a myth mm -hmm. uh, and some of the things that um, it, the rest of the book essentially is like examples of how that's that's a myth. So yeah, if you didn't know what veneer theory was, now you do. Well, now we do. <laughs> um, and this kind of, go ahead, Steve. I was going to ask you a question, but go ahead. Uh, he mentions in there about, about this idea of the placebo effect and how um, you can get some, you can get like a like a pill right that has nothing but it'll make you feel better or if you if you put someone through surgery but don't actually do something and tell them it was successful they'll feel better right that's mm -hmm. the placebo but he was calling it a nocebo effect so that if if everyone tells you you're bad for long enough you start expecting yourself to be bad and other people to be worse, right? Um, and I thought that was really interesting, that veneer. It's its not just, I mean, just knowing it, but hearing it over and over again, it starts, you start to believe it, that's all. Yeah. yeah, no, that's so true. And I actually, this made me think of, I did this like rant on Twitter one day, it was like a video, because there was this thread of people just bashing millennials and bashing Gen Z mm -hmm. and calling us lazy and entitled and like stupid. And I just kind of was like, you know what, as a millennial, I was like, you know what, I work really hard. <laughs> like I have had a job since I was like 15 or 16. I've been working, I have been in school, like, come on, give me a break. And I was like, you know what, if you tell us these things over and over and over again, we become these things, <laughs> you know, like we start to believe it. And if we start to believe it, we start to be it. You know, like if you tell us we're lazy, if you tell us we're entitled, we start to feel like maybe we are. And then we get kind of down and then guess what? You see lazy, we feel depression. And that's really what's happening, you know? And so I kept thinking about that. Like, yeah, if you believe someone's, if you believe someone's terrible and you tell them they're terrible, they're gonna start to act terrible. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really curious in the chat if anyone uh, feels like the idea of veneer theory is something that's been fine, you know, fine tuned into your body in some way or downloaded onto you in some way. Like, I'm just really curious to know because that was the that was the tone that set the whole book. And we're gonna go into all of the things that explain how that's false, but like it was even then it was just interesting to be like. Well, I get where he's going with this, and I have a feeling. <laughs> Kiss me feelings. Okay, so moving on. The real Lord of the Flies. So first off, was another, comments. another thing to put in the chat, if you've read Lord of the Flies. Let's go through some comments while we talk about this. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, this was a book titled Lord of the Butterflies. <laughs> that is amazing. Yes. I Please tell that student to write it and that I will read it no matter what. <laughs> uh, Lord of the Butterflies is probably closer to the true story of the kids who got stranded. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, definitely. The Lord of the Flies is one of those where, it, it, yeah. I think this was when, uh, Pastor Steve, you said this, the Lord of the Flies was one that you were interested in. Yeah, I mean, well, no, it's silly. This is this is just what I find so ironic and in, in a really negative way. But I've never read The Lord of the Flies. I started to read it. I thought it was boring, and I didn't continue it. So I have just heard about The Lord of the Flies, and I have accepted it as true, right? I understand the premise. I know what's supposed to happen. I know everything about it. I know the point, okay? But I've never read it. I tried. I didn't. So, But I've, I've assumed it. But then when he talks about what actually happened when guys were, um, you know, stranded on an island for a while, the truth is completely different. So I've accepted this lie. 
<laughs> that's a fictional account that I haven't read that I just know. Um, and it's affected all kinds of decisions that I've made along the way. In fact, this is one thing that's maybe sort of silly, but I love teaching seventh and eighth grade confirmation students. Like it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I just think they're great because they're like adults, but with childish tendencies. I mean, like, you know, they're half kids, half adults. They yeah. have great ideas, but they're insane. But I love it. Uh, but most uh, pastors that I've talked to hate confirmation. They hate seventh and eighth graders. They just can't wait till they're out of it. You know, they just don't want to do this. But I wonder sometimes if they just believe, because they'll they'll refer to the Lord of the Flies. <laughs> they'll refer, oh, it's insane. It's like, really? Because, like, that's not my experience. Like, you know, like, I know that's supposed to be my experience, but it's not. And this book kind of gives me um, permission to say, it shouldn't be the normal experience. <laughs> um, you know, confirmation kids aren't evil, you know, crazy people. They're good, crazy people with that. <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't have this thought earlier, but I have my original Lord of, copy of Lord of the Flies and I read it in sophomore year of high school. I'm pretty sure it was sophomore year of high school. And so I'm like, I, I open it up. How horrible. <laughs> All my annotations, like, wow. Okay, so I'm going to do this and, like, tweet about it later, and we'll see. But anyway, yeah, so, so Lord of the Flies is, is not real, guys. Not only is it a fictional story, it's, like, there's an actual mm -hmm. real story where yeah, some young boys. Them. Yeah, that basically just proves everything. Um, so just shouting out really fast, so for those of you who haven't read it, I mean – they they were actually shut on an island for a long time, not just like a weekend. Okay, so they're actually, what was that? Wasn't it eighteen months? I feel yeah. like it was like eighteen months. Yeah, it was some a, a large amount of of months. Yeah, um, and and they thrived. I mean, obviously, it was like you know, it was hard, but um, they yeah, they, the book talks about how they worked together. If they if they fought. They had a really strict system of everyone else in the group separated those two individuals. They had to go calm down and then come back together and find a way to figure it out. And that was, you know, these are all younger guys. Like I think maybe like this, I think seventh and eighth to like slightly older teen yeah. guys. Um, what else did they do? Like they... I don't know. They, they just like works together really well. I guess. Um, I mean, they survive. They yeah. work together to survive. Yeah, they and that. instead of like falling apart, they actually kind of thrived in a way. I mean, obviously not super thrived because they are very grateful to be found. Um, but they did survive. And it was like a comfortable way of surviving in that like they all helped each other. One kid, I think at one point, like broke, like fell and broke his leg. And they all yeah. set up him. <laughs> and then, and then, did then they were... They were him. <laughs> yeah, because they were like, then he was he was just like um, sitting around all the time. And they're like, no, we'll do your job for you, like until you get better. I mean, yeah. I just thought that was such a great example, and it yeah. makes sense. I mean, when you really think about it, the the most self interested thing you could do is to get along with the other people that you're together with. I mean, why would you want to kill them? Like, then it would just be one less person to help. I mean, yeah. It really doesn't make a lot of sense right? when you think about it. the whole Lord of the Flies concept really mm -hmm. doesn't make a lot of sense unless you just assume we're all just as as he was and like this Hobbes guy, right, his understanding, <laughs> like mm -hmm. if you take us out of our school, we're just going to kill each other. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, that sounds so absurd. that sounds so absurd. You know what I mean? Like, it really does. Like, that's not, I feel like that's not immediately what we're going to think unless we've been influenced to think that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Immediately, your immediately, your immediate thought of like, oh, I'm like leaving the kids home for the day isn't, oh my God, they're going to kill each other. That's not your immediate thought. But that's like, unless you've kind of been influenced by Lord of the Flies and you're like, oh, should I leave my kids home? Because I feel like they're going to mm -hmm. kill each other. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought this up, Phil, because, um, yeah, I, for I forgot the specifics of his background, but I remember reading that and being like, oh, yeah, he had kind of a shitty 
<laughs> like he didn't have yeah. the best life. Like I could imagine how someone who had a lot of negativity in their life that felt that they never saw what it was like to thrive, like um, would have that out view on humanity. And so, um, so yeah, definitely a good follow up. I mean, another thing that I'll just quickly point out that's interesting about this book that like going into it, I didn't know I was like, I was like, oh, this is interesting, is, you know, the subtitle is a hopeful history, um, but it's not, like, told in, like, this, like, he's not going through, like, from the beginning of time. Like, he yeah. covers a ton of ground, but yeah. it's all, like, storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's not linear. Yeah. It's very, like, I'm going to tell this because it fits here. It fits with what I'm trying to say, but it might be quite literally from, like, prehistoric times, or it might be from yesterday. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So... So, but getting into, this is definitely one of the things that gets into um, our uh, evolution as humans, which is a big part of how he makes his point. So he to uh, coins this term, I I'm guessing that's, it's him, called homo puppy. Um, yeah, chapter three, it's like my favorite chapter. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. And yeah. he coined that one phrase too, survival of the friendliest, yeah. which is like, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's the chapter that I was like, oh. I feel better about humanity now. <laughs> yeah. So really quickly before we get into the discussion of it, um, essentially he pulls this study that was done. I forget exactly time. It was like post World War II, I think, over somewhere in Russia. Yeah, the sixties, I think. Yeah. Sixties and sixties. Yeah. So essentially there was like a professor who hired a, a woman who, to work for him and he's like, I want you to do this study for me. So she goes out to like I don't know, middle of Siberia or something like that. And like yeah. breeds this um, type of like the silver fox, I think. It was a fox. Yeah, it was a fox. Silver yeah. fox. Yep. Breeds the silver fox, which is known for being the most vicious breed of fox. Um, to for the the friendliest within those groups. Who breeds Yeah, the they wanted to domesticate them. Like, how would you take like this silver fox and domesticate it, essentially turned it into a puppy um, because they were talking about how like dogs, for example, like how would they go from these great like wolf type creatures into like, you know, the teeniest, tiniest of like teacup poodle domesticated, you know, little things like how do you, how do you do that? Um, and so, yeah, he like s sent them there and it, they turned out they were like, oh, well, they must be breeding like the smartest, like, oh, it's the smartest ones. But turns out they're actually breeding like the friendliest ones, the ones that wag happen to like wag their tail or like stick their tongue out or something when they would yeah. see her walk by or not the one that wouldn't try to bite her. I feel like I just heard this again because I was listening through it a second time and she's like, if she would stick her hand in and they didn't immediately bite her, yeah. that would be the one that she, yeah. Yeah, she like, we'll and, keep you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was so cool because the whole point was he was the whole I feel like the before or earlier on in that chapter, or maybe it was the end of the one previously, but he was saying like humans think that we're, you know, we're the best because we're either the strongest, but that's not true. Um, we're the smartest, we think, but that's not true because it talks about the Neanderthals, that mm -hmm. they were stronger and they were smarter. They would have had bigger brains than we did. So how did we, why are we looking at them in the middle of the museum, right? And mm -hmm. it was because we were the friendly, like the friendliest. <laughs> yeah, um, we collaborated. So we had community. Cool thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, well, there were so many cool things in that chapter, like the fact that we have lights in our eyes so you can see where we're looking and how that matters. And I have a seven month old baby right now. And it is so true. Like when I, when she looks at me, when I can tell she's looking at me and not at her mom, that makes me happy, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, da, 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 da. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's really, it bonds us. And yeah. if those weren't, if those whites weren't there, that would, that would matter, you know, like mm -hmm. I wouldn't know where she was looking. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they're just all these cool things. Yeah. And so essentially the, the, the experiment is successful and she literally takes this fox that's known for being the most vicious fox and turns then domesticates them and turns the foxes into like these really 
and it's not even like we think of like human evolution you know as being this like big huge long drawn out thing and like it's in her lifetime like i think it takes like a couple decades or something and she's there like she it was like a it was like a cakewalk <laughs> like yeah. so um so yeah so really really like yeah i, I really like those that was essentially the, the two things that started that really like already it's like really hard so like argue the opposite of what the argument that he's trying to make because it's like those two things of like you have this story that's like you know so many of us have read it it's so ingrained in our culture and then he like well because he, he does talk about how it was really really hard to find an actual example of an, a real life lord of the flies because otherwise how is he going to prove his point and so it was really hard to find it and he did find it and then the fact that it was so the other side of the coin and then to also back up more i guess a more that's like more story oriented uh, uh, this chapter, chapter three, was more science oriented, where you just literally see an, an example of how um, the, the importance of us, you know, not just us, because this is a fox, <laughs> but like a species, a living, a living entity being friendly. Um, so, yeah. So, moving on. Uh, and can I just mention, I don't know where this was, but. Um... I feel like it was around that chapter. It was just talking about how when we think of intelligence, it's that getting along with other people, that's an extremely important part of it. And he talks about um, like this whole planet of geniuses versus the planet of copycats. Do you remember that mm -hmm. wherever it is? I don't know where it is, but, but he talks about how we think of intelligence as being able to come up with this like learn, learning how to fish, like learning how to use a pole or something like that's intelligence. But that, um, but like if you can learn from somebody else, if you can copy them, like the, anyway, he was making the point, like even if one out of 10 people could learn on their own to fish, if you had one out of 100 copycats learn how to fish, like 99% of the copycats all know how to fish after the end of a year or whatever, and only like, 50% of the geniuses do. And the, his point mm -hmm. is like that, that kindness, that being able to get along with other people, learning from other people, that's what made us, you know, evolve. That's what made us su succeed, I guess I should say, mm -hmm. um, rather than just our big brains. It's getting along with people, learning from them. And like I said, I have this little baby. She just learns so fast, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how she, that's how she is going to survive, right? <laughs> it's by yeah. learning so quickly. Um, right. Whether she's a genius or not, I don't know, but. <laughs> yeah, and he goes into that kind of later, the flip side, because it's mirroring, it's, I, is what he says, it's called mirroring. And he says it's, it can work the other way too. If you're going into a situation where er everyone's acting distrustful and acting um, suspicious, then you kind of start acting distrustful and suspicious too. You're like, oh, if this person is acting that way, maybe I should be acting that way because maybe they know something that I don't know. Um, uh -huh. But then if you change that, if you walk into a room and everyone's like smiling and like having a good time, then you're more inclined to like have a good time and be more trustful and, you know, let your guard down a little bit. And so it can go either way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, it was definitely, I, I, I'm glad that you did bring that up. The idea of the, we, we we just like we valor so much the the cunningness um and but behind that is like selfishness whereas mm -hmm. you know just the like mellow yellow getting along <laughs> we should all want to be hufflepuffs <laughs> i'm a hufflepuff <laughs> <laughs> sorry but you know i had uh, you even thought about that that is so great yeah we should all want to be hufflepuffs yeah, but nobody wants to be Hufflepuffs. Like, think about that. That's yeah. you know, y'all want to be Gryffindor. Yeah, everybody wants to be Gryffindor, or like if the iconoclasts want to be Slytherin because yeah. you know that's but Hufflepuffs saying, the are the ones who get along with Slytherin. So yeah, Hufflepuffs yeah. are the ones that actually you know my boyfriend is Slytherin. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing. I'm sure my husband is also Slytherin. If I read him to the test. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think there's, and I, I don't remember if he went into this too much because I think about this kind of thing all the time too, but 
like it's almost like it's it's a weakness to like show kindness and i think he does go into that actually like thinking about it is people think it's like a weakness <laughs> to show this kindness and all um or to show trust um when in fact it's this incredible strength it's a revolutionary strength um and it takes incredible courage to believe that someone's good rather than believe that somebody's bad and yeah so everybody i think i think we can just stop there everybody should want to be a hufflepuff yeah and <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. um, I think the, also the 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 phrase um, I don't know, he doesn't mention this in the book, but it would have fit nicely. But the phrase like "nice guys finish last." No, I think he does mention it. He's got to mention it at some point. The phrase "nice guys oh, finish last" you. is like bogus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice guys finish last after all the people who have climbed their way to their top actually like de destroy everything. And then the nice guys are over there, like, have, have fun with that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And on that note, the, ne the next thing that we learned, I wrote, we really don't like killing people. Yes. Yeah. Someone put a great comment in here about that. Let's go back to that comment. Let me find um, it. These are, I think, in order. So I think this was maybe chapter four. Um, mm -hmm. the, the people who didn't shoot, I think that was, that was the story for that like one. Nice. So there's two, or there's actually a few Several different times. Yeah, he brings that up a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of his favorite him. things to say, talk about is how given the chance to kill each other, no one actually wants to kill each other. We don't even want, we don't even want the possibility of accidentally killing somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. and this is so interesting. I told my kids about this because I thought it was so important. Like 95% of people don't shoot when given the opportunity. So, and I think this has a lot to do with politics too, but um, like, like the idea of stabbing someone is harder than shooting them, right? So the idea, if you've watched Game of Thrones, the idea that we're willing to just cut each other up with swords isn't really realistic. It's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But think about what we do now. Now we have, like they're saying like 75% of deaths in World War II were from remote bombs. Because if you're flying over a city, you could drop a bomb on them and feel like, you know, that's not as bad. And now think about what we have. Now we have drones. So we have like yeah. a computer, um, a video game, and we can fly across the seas, you know, the oceans and just, you know, feel like we're dropping a bomb. We're not really even feeling like it. It's just a video game. And so yeah. now it's easier to kill people. I just thought that was really interesting because they know it, this is obviously known by the armed forces or else they wouldn't be learning to do this. Like, it's got to be an issue if you can't get people to kill each other. If you still need to kill, how are you going to do it? Well, make it a video game. You know, <laughs> don't don't expect them to stab someone with a knife. That's not yeah. realistic. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And he he actually connects that to social media too. He's like, you know, the further yeah. removed you are from something, the the less you just think about the impacts of it. So you know, for example flying a drone from a completely a different continent <laughs> and killing people like you don't think about it. It's, it's not immediate. Same thing on social media. You can just say the most vile things to people and not yeah. take into account like their mental health or their environment because it's to you, it's like, well, I don't know that person. So what I say doesn't matter. What I say to them doesn't matter. It's just out there in the universe. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. Um, when, you know, and I'm connecting this to things I learned in school, is when it, the reality is we're all like more closely connected than we think. We know people who know people who know the same people we know. You know what I mean? Like everyone is connected. There are these like networks that connect us to each other. And we just don't, we just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's the same concept for social media as it is for like actual war, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that was that was a really interesting part. This is one of my favorite quotes. I've got to throw it in here. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite. I made sure and write it down. Um, it said, violence isn't easy. Here's the quote. Movie violence has about as much to do with violence as pornography has to do with sex. I thought that was so good. <laughs> I have that one highlighted. I have that one highlighted too. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, that, that is clever. Yeah. Yeah. So I, think I thought it was really good. Yeah, I think it's just a, it's just good to like really know that for sure because I think our media in so many ways uh, tries to um, really yeah stick to this old notion of 
of that, you know, we are bloodthirsty creatures, you know, and we like, we like revenge, um, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I don't know, I can't even, I don't even know anyone who actually likes the idea of revenge. Um, I am not a, I do not keep grudges. I know a couple of people who like keep grudges and I like, I have had, I had like one instance where I just like, I didn't, I don't even want to say call them out because call them out sounds really confrontational. It was more like, I just asked them, I was like, do you have a grudge against that one thing that happened between us? And they were just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, I was like, I'm really sorry. Like, you know, like we just kind of like talked through it. And then they were like, yeah, you're right. I do have a grudge. But then like, you know, like I also like wanted to make sure that they felt like it's okay. Like, you know, like, or, you know, I'm sorry or whatever, you know, like, so um, really at the end of the day, like you can, you can conflict manage, you can, uh, what's the, there's a phrase, like you can um, harm, harm reduction. That's the phrase I think mm -hmm. it's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. That kind of made me think of actually a quote. It's not even his quote. It's something somebody else said. Um, but he, he talking about how like movies and stuff like that just really isn't like, a, like it's not real life. And it was, oh, it was uh, in the epilogue. If you make a film about a man kidnapping a woman and chaining her to a radiator for five years, something that has happened probably once in history, it's called searingly realistic analysis of society. If I make a film like Love Actually, which is about people falling in love, and there are about a million people falling in love in Britain today, it's called a sentimental presentation of an unrealistic world. And I yeah. really like that. You know, because it was like, oh, of course, people, more people are falling in love than are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we we only make movies and we only make news about these like really big things that happen. And the reason they're news is because they don't happen that often. But in our minds, and this goes back to the plane crashes, in our minds, we're like, oh well, it made the news, so it must be something they're trying to warn us about. So it must be something that happens often. <laughs> it's like, no, uh -huh. that's literally not it. <laughs> Yeah, my dad is a airplane, like not a pilot. I mean, he can fly, but he's like an airplane mechanic. And yeah, he talks about how like, you know, like the airplanes are like so much safer than cars and like, yeah. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, once you're, he's like, once you're up there, like statistically speaking, you're not going to come down. Like <laughs> we have to like make the plane come down <laughs> anyway. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So the next one is, this is one, there were just a couple of things that for me that I did have, a, even as I was reading about it, there was like still a little uh, of resistance. Um, so I think it's just one of those things where you have, sometimes you have to have nuance in your conversation. So anyway, um, the next thing I wrote, uh, what we learned, I put, uh, civilization kind of sucks. Um, and so yes. the, the quote that, um, Rudger Bregman uses, so I'll read this. This is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, by the way, I believe that's the guy who's in charge of, in charge of, <laughs> he owns it. Um, one of my favorite quotes. Um, I'll maybe we'll read it later. But anyway, so this is like a French guy from a long time ago. He wrote, <laughs> the first man who, after enclosing a piece of ground, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. How many crimes, how many wars would that man have saved the human species who should have cried to his fellows, be sure not to listen to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong equally to us all and the earth itself to nobody. Yeah. Know, hopefully that's not too weird, like hard to understand because it is like older language. <laughs> it's essentially like one day, some man decided this land is mine. No one else can have it. Whereas before land just belonged to everybody land, or it didn't belong to anybody. It was just land. Like the earth was the earth and we respected it. <laughs> and one day some guy was like, nope, actually this little piece of land right here, this is mine. No one else can have it. In fact, you're going to work for me on it. You know what I mean? And like it, it started off all these things. Whereas before, like people didn't normally go to war because what are you going to fight over? You don't own anything. What's there to have a war over? Um, and so that's essentially what he's saying. And 
uh, Rutger Bregman goes into a lot. He kind of asks the question, like, is society our downfall? Like, is I'm society sorry. the reason the world's going to end, <laughs> essentially? Like, is civilization actually as good of a thing as we yeah. are told that it is? So really, we should say, it's probably should specify, like, not the world, like, because the world's going to go on without us. You know, it's been yeah. here a long time without us. You know, it's like the world to us, you know, our world. Um, so yeah, Pastor Steve, I'm so curious to know what you think about this, um, like based on your uh, background too in the church, I guess, you know, like the, I feel like the Christian church has had an interesting relation with this, but um, also you are as an individual, like your personality and um, yeah, just curious what you think about the, this concept that he went into. Well, and I, I know that there was some place he said that um, some people, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but it is something I've thought about. Like some people see sort of the entrance of sin in the Bible story as sort of the entrance of civilization. Because think about it, like, according to Genesis, at least Adam and Eve were put in a garden, right? To take care of it and to sort of hang out. And mm -hmm. then once sin entered the world, then they had to leave the garden and go out and I guess become civilized, you know? But I mean, originally they weren't right i mean they're just sort of oh. naked not wearing clothes i mean it was sort of this i, I don't know it, it, it's just sort of before civilization mm -hmm. and i i think he mentions that that some people see the entrance of sin as being sort of going into civilization itself so i thought that was really interesting that's really um, how, interesting. i have not thought about that i didn't think all. about that either <laughs> yeah, it it really, really, <laughs> I mean, it was really cool. Now, I have never heard of that before, and I, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I remember in seminary, one of the things that I was taught was, and I, I'm not sure how this relates, maybe it's, I'm not even sure if, if Rutger Bregman would agree with this at all, but, like, um, so, one of the understandings, like, um, that I was taught was, well, how, how do I present this? So you can look at human beings in two ways, as normally good or normally bad, <laughs> right? Good or evil, okay? Um, but see, I was taught, maybe wrongly, I don't know, but um, that I shouldn't look at all humanity as necessarily good because then my goal would be to sort of try to chain them so that they don't do bad things. I was taught <laughs> to see humanity as sort of inherently evil, so I want to free them to be who God created them to be. Um, so in bondage to sin, so that Jesus might free them to be the good people God created them to be. So I don't know, on the one hand, Rutgers saying, no, all humans are good. So that sort of goes against what I was taught. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, like I do like the idea that my goal would be to set people free to be who God truly wanted them to be. So. I don't know. It's just something I've been thinking about. I'm sure I'll talk about it on my channel. I didn't want to talk about it before we had the book club, <laughs> but I've been like waiting for it. Oh, nice. Okay, good. <laughs> to That's talk cool. about some of these yeah. ideas that are going around and around in my head. So, um, well, I'm looking forward to that then. I mean, sounds like maybe yeah. you and I had for very different reasons, but also had a little like, hmm, when it came to this, this concept, I think, well, I'll, I'll let Megan speak, but I'll just say, like, I, I, I think, like, it, it, it's gonna, I don't see, for a lot of people, it's probably gonna do that, because it's literally, like, we're just gonna, like, dig up all our homes and just, like, throw them out to the sea, like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, that was a little bit of, like, under the surface what I, what I was feeling, but um, I don't think Rutger Bregman is arguing for that in this text. I think he's just using this as like, we probably should consider the bigger picture here, guys. So anyway, um, yeah. Megan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes along to what I was gonna say is I don't think he ended up coming to the conclusion that like civilization is inherently bad or that we shouldn't have it. I think what he was saying is that, and what I think is, and what I've been saying over the course of the whole book club is that like, we're just doing it wrong. <laughs> we need to be working harder at it. I feel like we just built it and then decided, okay, let's just let it go. Let's yeah. And then just didn't nurture it. We stopped nurturing our society. And instead we're doing the exact opposite. In fact, we're just like, how far can we push it? Like, 
how many buttons can we push? How much stuff can we kill? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's like, we're, instead of like nurturing it, we're, we're doing the exact opposite. And so I don't think we need to get rid of civilization. That would be hella uncomfortable, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I really like, I really like my bathroom. Oh. <laughs> I like toilet like paper. <laughs> I really like to cook on a stove. I like the microwave. As much as I love cooking, I love yeah. the microwave. You know, I, I like my instant pot. I do. Like civilization is a good thing. It's just that like we need to be going about it a different way. We need to rebuild that trust because we can't have things like UBI. We can't have things like climate change, like climate change reform. We can't have those things until we trust each other. And so really what needs to happen almost before UBI, almost before climate change, it's just this radical turnaround of trusting. And I think it's not like civilization really that's going to be the downturn of like human beings or humanity as we know it. It's, it's gonna be our own stubbornness. <laughs> it's gonna be our yeah. own like distrust in each other. And it, you know, in this book and in Future Earth, cause I kept thinking of Future Earth the entire time I was like reading this. Um, that was by Eric Holthaus. We read that last year. Um, is that it's not too late. People keep telling us, oh, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Um, but it's not. <laughs> we have plenty of time to turn this around, but we actually have to want to. Um, and so that's kind of my thoughts that I was that I was thinking. And I think that's kind of what he, what Rucker and what Eric was talking about in his book it was what they kind of came to is that civilization isn't inherently bad. It's just we've stopped caring about it <laughs> and we need to just turn that care back on again and start trusting each other and then we can make things change you know we can if i trust you to spend your own money then like you'll trust yourself to spend your own money and you might use those things to you know live more sustainably or buy from small businesses or invest in you know as and we're talking about like property being like the reason all this started but investing in a home a space that you know you can bring people together and, you know, talk, you know, and I, so I think before we can get to that, we really have to trust each other. And so I think I liked that that's kind of what he came to as an answer was that maybe, maybe civilization is the reason all this is happening. But if we're aware of that and we learn all of this history and we know where we came from, then we can fix it and we have to acknowledge it and then we can fix it and then we can make civilization a great thing. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that was one of your best mic drops, Megan. We just need to do it better. Book drop. Yes. Civilization, <laughs> but better. Um, and really quickly, since you brought up the climate change, I think thing, like I will say, like he, they both say something really similar, him and Eric Holthaus. Um, oh, did I find it? I guess I need to find it. I don't even need to read the whole book though. How about um, the climate change activist fear mongering? <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, I'll just say it because I want to be quick anyway. Rutger said specifically, we need a new, or the climate change needs a new reality. And um, Eric Holthaus said something I really liked, which was he wasn't exactly saying the same thing, but I think they're very similar. And he was saying, we need a new imaginary. So he's, he's uh, Eric Holthaus is speaking more to specifically like what the climate change movement is doing. And then Rupert Bregman is speaking to like how they're operating or, you know, like their mm -hmm. paradigm. So anyway, um, yeah. So interesting stuff guys moving on. Um, okay. So then we get into, now we're really getting into the guts of all the book. History is wrong. Um, and I wrote down the, I wrote down four moments, but if there's another, uh, thing we want to talk about, um, Easter Island, the, the Zimbardo experiment, the shock experiment and Catherine Susan Genovese died in the arms of her neighbor. So um, any of those in particular stand out to you that you remember? Well, as the resident murderino, um, <laughs> true crime girl, um, yeah. I have heard the story of Kitty Genovese a million times. Yeah. A million times. And I remember being taught it in, like, go ahead. I just want to say, like, I remember being, well, actually, I'll, I'll say, I'll remember all of those things except for Easter Island, the the mm -hmm. psychology stuff and, and Kitty. I think it was, in, I took a psychology class in high school. Mm -hmm. Random, I got to take one in high school. And uh, they went, she, or the teacher went over all of those things and did not present them in the way that 
You know, I did not hear the true story of how, you know, Kitty Genovese's murder, which if you guys did not know about it, I just always assume people know more about true crime um, <laughs> before realizing that not as many people are into it as I am. Um, but essentially she was a woman who was murdered in front of her apartment complex in New York City, where there are tons of people. And I think they call it, how many witnesses? Um, I'm like, like, it was like, yeah, it was like 30 something witnesses is what they said. Um, and they used that as an example of how like, we don't care about each other. Someone could literally be murdered in front of us and we don't care. Um, we just won't do anything about it. And so for years, this is like what people taught in psychology classes. And I did not hear the true story until like very recently. <laughs> about how, first of all, this is like a gay neighborhood. Um, they didn't want, like they, people didn't get involved really because they could not come out as as homosexual. Like they couldn't, they would lose their lives, lose their jobs, lose, lose everything, um, first of all. Uh, second, Kitty was going home to her girlfriend, which like was not mentioned before. Um, also like three different people, three or four different people called the police. They did call, but because it was yeah. a man and a woman outside, they just assumed it was like a domestic thing. That's what they assumed it was. It was like, oh, it's just a man and a woman arguing and they're married or something, you know, it's, or they're, it's her boyfriend or like, it's just an argument. And like, we don't want to get involved in a domestic argument. Like it's, it's their business. And then the part that is so like, to me that no one knew is that she died in the arms of her friend. <laughs> her friend came outside and found her and held her as she died. And like, that's how she died. Not as like some forgotten woman in the street who no one cared about, but she died as someone who was very loved and died in the arms of her friend. <laughs> and that's, that's the real story. And that's not the story that people know. And that was insane to me. So I was really glad that he told that story because it's not true that people aren't just going to help. And then he tells another story to kind of back that up of this woman who, I don't remember how it happened, but somehow she got into an accident and her car was going into a river, or I think it was a sound. And instead of everyone ignoring it, two or three random strangers who did not know each other saved not only her child, but they saved her before the car even was immersed in the water. So they had to work fast. And some random person was like, here, take this and like threw it to them. And he, it was like a, like a, a tire iron or something to like break the window. And these people did not know each other. And then they just went about their business. They made sure she was okay. They made sure no one was called and they were like, okay, bye. <laughs> you know, and left. And it was like, this is really what humanity is. And so I was, that's the one I got really excited about because that was just like, wow, this is a story that even, even within like a subset of like true crime people, because that is like a little subset of the population who like really get into this. We were all told the wrong thing. And then it's not till recently that we learned the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty crazy. Pastor Steve, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, I can't remember the four examples. So we <laughs> that you gave. So, that you gave an excellent uh, rundown of that. So the other things were Easter Island, and then I put the two experiments down. To me, the Zimbardo experiment Ooh. was really big, and there's also the shock experiment. My, I was telling my dad about humankind, trying to get him to read it. And he thought that he might have been part of that experiment, or at least been been a part of an experiment where he had to shock somebody. And so it was just really interesting because I believe it. Like um, I know people, like I talk to people. One of the things that I've learned as a pastor is everybody I know has done something just horrible. Like, <laughs> I mean, truly, but it's not who they normally are. Like, but they've done something they're horribly embarrassed about that they're ashamed of, you know, and if you get to know them well enough, they might tell you, right? But even if they haven't ever told me, I know what's happened. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's just, so anyway. Um, but why they do that thing or why they're hiding it as well is really interesting. Like, why did they shock people? Well, number one, they thought it was, they were doing something good, right? They mm -hmm. thought they were helping science. They thought they were, you know, it was hurting them to do it, but they're willing to sacrifice for the greater good, right? <laughs> anyway, um, it just really made me was interested and it reminded me about a lot of the issues of power and about how the only way you can get someone to do something bad is like to convince them it's for a good purpose. Um, mm -hmm. I just, 
yeah, I just thought it was really, really interesting. <laughs> we talked about the German soldiers with that, about how a lot of them yeah. thought that what they were doing was for a greater good. Yeah, I mean, it makes so much sense to me. Like I could imagine, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but if someone was telling me to do it, right, and tol telling me and saying, you need to do this, you need to do this, mm -hmm. maybe I would. I'm a people pleaser, you know, like maybe I'd justify it and saying, well, that, they're probably not really getting hurt. And that's, know, or, that's what some of them said afterwards. They were like, oh, we didn't really believe that they were actually being shocked. They thought they were lying to them. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let's put really that, interesting. let's put that with uh, together with what Megan was bringing up, what, um, because that's further down on my list anyway. So the shock experiment with um, oh the chapter on where he was like, obviously I can't write a book about humans being good without going into um, World War II and the Nazis, um, and so. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it doesn't like take a deep dive into the whole the whole affair. It really just focuses on, um, and and again, like this is it's a historical and like scientific text. So he's really looking at you know, data and interviews and um, things that he can. He's not just pulling stuff out because he feels like it, right? So he does um, talk about how like why the the Nazis, why the German army was as strong and sort of indestructible as it was. And so he looks at um, some uh, psychologists, and, I, and I'm totally paraphrasing here, and I haven't read it in a little while, but so add if I miss something out. But from what I remember, it's like, you know, some psychologists are hired or, you know, join the military and are specifically looking at, well, first how to break the, the German army and the German people um, to, to make them weaker. All of their tactics that they do because they focus on, and it's like just getting right at it, they focus on ideology. All of those tactics focusing on ideology of like Hitler is bad or, or just like you're oppressed. I forget exactly what they, what they do, but they kind of take that approach. And so they try to spread propaganda against Hitler, right? Um, none of that works. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah. And so they find out, and then they, they, I think through interviewing German soldiers that are captured, they try to get like, why are you doing these things? Like, why are you fighting this war, you know, for this terrible cause or this terrible person or whatever? And they discover that the reason is because my friends are in the war, like because I'm fighting along my countrymen, because I'm fighting along my neighbor, you know? It's like, this is our side and I don't wanna see I don't want to see my family, my friends, my countrymen, anyone, you know, perish and lose and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so it's, a, it's not really, he doesn't look into Hitler. He talks about power in, in his whole other chapter. He isolates that as its own, just its own like construct that needs to be disseminated. But um, he looks at specifically the Nazi fighters and yeah, saying like basically, kind of like what we were saying with the shock experiment. Like they they did these terrible things because um, not necessarily that they felt that they were doing good, but a, a, like an example, a kind of offshoot of that is like, they felt like, you know, I, I'm trying to fight for someone I love, essentially. Mm -hmm. if, it, yeah. if, if you think I got that right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I put this in the chat, but he calls it like evil disguise is good. I think he has like a whole section on that about how like e sometimes evil is like it, the people who are doing these things, it wasn't described to them as this evil thing. It was described to them as like, no, fight for your countrymen, fight for your friends. And meanwhile, there's this whole other like underlying agenda going on of like, and your friends aren't these people, your friends are these people. <laughs> You know, and so it, it, they thought they were doing, and like you were saying, maybe not a good thing, but like something that was better than whatever they thought the alternative was. And so, yes, this thing was evil, but we're doing this evil for a greater good. Um, and so it's 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 definitely like an interesting thing to look into and, and something that I commend him for because that is not an easy topic to go into. That is not an easy one to cover because our what's our immediate reaction? Their immediate reaction is like, no, they're they're evil. They're terrible yeah. people. And yeah. a lot of times he says, but these people that you think are terrible are also moms and dads and fathers 
or that's a dad <laughs> and brothers, <laughs> brothers, brothers and sisters. And they, they have people that they care about and they have people that mean the world to them and they are the world to other people. And we like to like distance ourselves by thinking, oh, they're not like us. And they are us <laughs> given the right circumstances, um, being told the right thing. And, you know, I, and so I think he just, he does a great job of saying like what they did was bad, but they are still human beings. <laughs> and I think he, he does a really respectful job of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought a lot about um, about this. Like, first of all, I thought about it from a perspective as a Christian. Like, how many atrocities have been done in the name of, well, I was doing it for God, you know, or, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, the Crusades, you know, or how many of these stories that you hear about, like, and, and these were, I believe, good people that were convinced somehow that, killing Muslims, you know, was what God wanted them to do, or at least what their church leaders told them to do, or they told them that God wanted them to do, you know, but it's not like they were bad people that were just horrible. They were mm -hmm. encouraged to believe that they were doing the right thing, you know? <laughs> so that was, that was one thing I thought about. I also thought a lot about um, in our current political situation, there are people that I struggle to understand and I see what they're doing, and I feel like it's evil. I feel like it's at least, um, maybe not evil, but um, like not good, <laughs> right? Um, Anti-democratic or whatever, or racist or whatever. But but again, I have to remember they're they're probably doing it for a, a reason that, at least from their perspective, they're protecting democracy or they're protecting somebody or they're loving their country, right? Um, so just it makes me think about that. And then from a personal standpoint, I think, have I ever done this? And I think like on Twitter, I try to be really positive in general, but like, if you want to really make me angry and make me rant, um, like put down Andrew Yang, you know, put down my guy, <laughs> make up something about him. And I'll like, I'll maybe say something really rude to you in response. Cause that's my guy, you know, don't, don't say something mean about him. Or again, like if um, same thing, like other Christians, if people are just putting down Christians, I feel like they're not really giving them a fair shake. Like this makes me angry. <laughs> like, why are you doing that? Um, and so then I might act in a way that's not kind and not nice, and not respectful, which are all things I care about, but just to protect the people that I feel close to. And that's what the book talks about. Like that's when we do the worst things. <laughs> the, the positives are that we can get along with people really well. Um, like that's, that's what gives us our evolutionary, um, that, that's why we survived. <laughs> but on the other hand, the negative is that when we make these connections to people, we wanna protect them. And that allows us to do some pretty horrible things to others that are in the other, other group, right? Yeah. yeah. And he, he goes into that, that whole thing about connection kind of in, in a different way and talking about how sometimes the reason people do the bad things that they do are because of a lack of connection and we're just not connected to each other anymore. That's one of the downsides of civilization is that we're so close yet so far from each other. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, he, talk, he talks about Mandela and apartheid and, um, how the twin brothers, <laughs> how they essentially were kind of responsible for Mandela, not solely responsible, but like they had a big part in, in Mandela's victory because, because they were on opposite sides where one brother was like, he had traveled the world and he had seen other people and, you know, he had listened to other ideologies and met people who don't look like him and think like him or talk like him. And it made him so much more like compassionate towards other people. And he was like, yes, absolutely. We need to end apartheid and we need to get Mandela in, in power. Whereas his brother, he stayed in South Africa and he went into the military and his whole life, his whole world was just protecting his people. And he was for apartheid, not because he was this evil human being, but because he was like, I have to protect my fellow my fellow met people, you know, like I have to protect us. And this is, a, this is what I'm about. And in fact, he was like, the face of the movement that was against that was against ending apartheid 
And then all it took was like his brother asking him, can you please just come sit down with me and Mr. Mandela and let him talk? <laughs> and he did. Yeah. And he was like, you know, he, what, it was the way he served him his tea that, he, that really stuck out to him. You know, he, he gave him everything he needed and all he needed to do was stir it. <laughs> and then like he spoke his language too. That was yes, I was gonna say that next yeah. is that like, then he didn't, he spoke to him in his own language, not just the language he could understand, but the language that he actually speaks. And, you know, he's talking about how like that connection is really you know, what sets us apart. And what made me think of this is sometimes, you know, in the in the church background that I that I was in, it was very fundamentalist, very you know rules, rules, rules. <laughs> and I'm sure these people they got and you know I don't feel like super traumatized by it because I've, as I've gotten out of it, I'm like you know this, a lot of those people that like gave me a lot of guilt <laughs> were doing this because they thought they were being good people and they were good people. I still look back at a lot of people in my life when I when I was in that church in that setting, they were truly good people they just went about in a weird way. But one of the things yeah. I was thinking about is why did, why was I able to kind of like break through out of a lot of that? But it's because I went away to college. I got out, <laughs> I got a job yeah. that was, in, I, I got a job in like fast food and I met people for the first time who didn't go to church, who went to public school, who like didn't think the same things that I thought. And I talked to them. And, you know, when I when I moved, uh, when I graduated college, I moved to like New Orleans and Louisiana. And that's a to totally different world than Maryland. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I got to really meet people and talk to people. And I've lived in several different places since. And so I have to kind of, you know, you, you have to kind of think like I have gotten these opportunities to really connect with people. The other people haven't. And that's why they still kind of think the way that they do is because they haven't actually had conversations with the people that they're trying to govern. <laughs> you know, for example, a lot of the times with UBI, obviously, we're always going to bring it back to that. This is the Yang Gang. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times with UBI is like the reason we want UBI is because who better than poor people know what poor people need? <laughs> they yeah. know what they need. <laughs> You know, like, and, and, and so this whole thing of like the lack of connection, just like, you know, if we could just sit and talk to each other, we don't have to be friends. We just need to have a conversation and you need to understand my side and I need to understand your side. And I might not agree with it, but now I understand where you're coming from. I know your motivations. Yeah, I know, I know in the last, I don't know if it was the epilogue or whatever, he had like the top 10 list of things mm -hmm. um, that he talked about. But one of them just reminded me of what you were saying, Megan. It, he says, um, don't do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They might have different tastes than yours. That's Bernard mm -hmm. Shaw that does that. But that that's exactly when I think about like our our government sort of like, well, we know that if we give you money, you're gonna be lazy. Maybe it's like projecting, like if they, you know, like they would be lazy, but like you don't really know what somebody would do. <laughs> um, and who, I mean, just, Tell, telling them what you think they need. Um, if you're poor, like, um, you know, saying you need food, for instance, I mean, yes, we all need food, but like, what if, what if you have enough food, but your car is broken and you really just need the cash to fix the car? Like, I mean, it just makes me think about UBI a lot and how people can make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we all we always find a way to bring it back to the end game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the eye, you know, it's a common thread of a lot of the books that we've read, and it's not like we're reading. We literally haven't read a single UBI book. We've read a couple books yeah. that touch on it, but we haven't. You know, Ruger Bregman, by the way, has a book that goes into UBI. Oh, um, that's an amazing book. <laughs> we, we should read that awesome. eventually. Utopia for Realists is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely interested in that. Okay, so this went by so fast. We're already at ten till an hour and a half, which is yeah. um, hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> Dude, your mom's picture is adorable. It looks exactly like her. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> These bitmoji things, man. <laughs> I love it. Sorry, um, I get really excited when she's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Me too. Um, okay, so oh, if, if you're interested, we talked. Had a, we brought Megan's mom on in a OG live stream. Go nice. find the one. I don't. Know, I don't think I saw that one. 
<laughs> it was, it was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. We got to talk about, um, we were talking about neurodiversity. And so it was really yes. I learned a lot about myself while she was talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to talk about this really quick. I am so sorry. We don't have enough time to get into all of this book entails. Yeah. Um, but there is a really great section where he does talk about participatory budgets and how it's something that people don't talk about a lot. And I re I think one of the reasons you know people don't talk about it is because it takes the power away from the people who like it. But essentially, the again the TLDR version of participatory budgets. There are certain places where the citizens have a direct say in what happens with their budget. They get to say, hey, look, this is where we actually need this money. Let's put it towards this. If we need new roads, let's put it towards new roads, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that's something that happens, I think, in New York City is one of the places that it's happening in America, but it's happening in a lot of places outside of the United States. So. That's a really good one to, if you read the book, look into a little bit further because it is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great quote. Oh, sorry, can I quote something from the book about that? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I told this to my kids too, to, because in democracy, people don't have power at all. We choose who will rule over us. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. love, I think that's so, um, that was like a mind blowing thing for me. Yeah. And it's like, we're just choosing I mean, and this makes me think about too, like, and it talks about in the, in the democracy, like, who are we? So who do we support? Like, I supported Andrew Yang. Why? Because he was kind. He he um, humble. He had these amazing ideas. He wanted to give the power to people and all this stuff, right? But according to the book, what we could expect, and I mean, I hate to think this, but like, if he became president, is that what power gives you brain damage, right? And yes. no matter how wonderful you are, um, that he would have this incentive to, um, you know, not be as good of a guy. Now I'm not saying he would turn into a bad guy. I'm just, I'm saying like people, we we choose people to put in power over us that seem like they're really great people, um, but then when they get into power, they they have this uh, I don't know tendency to want to keep power, want to get along with the other powerful people. I mean, it just makes me think about that. And I mean, it's true about everyone, just Andrew Yang, but something I think we have to be aware of. <laughs> I well, guess. Not, he, I've heard him talk about that on his podcast, Yang Speaks. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's good to know at least that he's, a, it's on the radar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. And that he, you know, is looking to go into some more uh, offices <laughs> TBD, <laughs> not really. Okay, <laughs> we won't go there um, on this live stream. So anyway, um, yeah, that's something we should just we could go on and on about that topic. But yeah, the, there's a whole chapter on how power corrupts. We didn't get to all the chapters, but um, the, the last thing before sure. we make it's a, it's a honker, you guys. It's it's a big one. <laughs> um, before we make our bookcase for humanity and sign off. Um, Really quickly though, I just, we have to talk about, this might, we might go a little over, yeah, we are. <laughs> it's okay. We have to talk about, um, you know, the, what, the, the way he talks about um, the way we could reform our education, our workplace and our justice system. Because this is, I just like, we can't skip this because this is where he's like, he's doing this whole thing where he's like taking down all of our perceived notions about humanity. <laughs> And uh, this is where he provides like the solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Yang Yang is a solutions oriented community. <laughs> um, I, so I'll just like zip through really fast. I really liked how he talks about, and this kind of gets, I think at participatory budgets, I would say. Um, I kind of have forgotten about that detail. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, so yeah, work, he talks about uh, how we, we don't need management. <laughs> in the workplace <laughs> we basically yeah. don't we need like a little bit but like essentially we can manage ourselves um i really like that detail i really liked in, how in education it's so much about um he talks about this school where it's like kids just run free all of the ages are together um they kind of do their own thing and then have their own projects that they individually work on. Mm -hmm. um, I thought those were a lot of interesting things. Uh, again, like less top down, more bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, of course, loved the 
the justice system reform where it's like, look, we need to stop seeing criminals as being uh, lo lower than human and like they can never be sort of, they can never redeem themselves. They can never re-enter society and contribute to society again. We do a terrible job. Like we kind of say that like, oh, you're supposed to go do your time and, and then come re-enter society and make it literally impossible. <laughs> and also like kick them while they're down. Um, yes. So yeah, those are some of my thoughts, uh, but I'm very curious to know you got and anyone in the chat, like this is something I think we all could add to because it's, it's a new conversations that are being had and it's great. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Kind of amazing. I, get, I get kind of frustrated really when I hear about like what Norway does and how amazing they are. And I'm like, why? I, I grew up learning that America was the best, right? I'm sure that wherever you live, you learn that your country is the best. But like, it bothers me that if everybody knows about this, why aren't we doing it? And and I and I want to believe that it's not because we're bad. Like I don't think our government is evil, right? Do they just not know about it? <laughs> like, do they not know that it's cheaper and more humanitarian and it works to do it the way that Norway does it? Like, how do we justify continuing to do our justice system the way it is? I just I just don't get it. So yeah, that was definitely. Uh, interesting part where I think it was um, it was North Dakota that there was someone um, who was taken to Norway, uh, like one of the people in charge of the just you know like police, not police station, but you know police forces and the ju the justice system there kind of taken to Norway. Saw how Norway has this really like they don't even have in some some of the prisons they don't even have gates and there's like murders there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, opposite of they what we have. Along. <laughs> they get along. They have their own like rooms. They have. They get to like do stuff and like garden and like do all the like self-sustaining society. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and she was just like, "Whoa!" Like she, she was blown away. And this is like, she is. A, I think they said that she was like Republican. And so she comes back mm -hmm. and she doesn't do that, but she starts saying like, "We need to start making reforms." And and then and she starts to say like uh, and like a big thing that they they cite, which is not like. The thing that number one thing that I want to cite, but like they cite that it's cheaper, <laughs> um, yeah. cheaper and more efficient, and you know that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I don't think that's the number one place our heads need to be at, but it's also not an it's not an invalid argument either. Um, that was something, and it was interesting. A little personal anecdote at the end of that chapter, I believe it's the end of that chapter. The that woman says, "I'm not liberal." I think she says, "I'm realistic." And being realistic or something yeah. like that. I had just been having a conversation with one of my cousins. We, we were talking about, you know, I think we were talking about kind of police reform or something like that. And just the the whole liberal versus conservative thing. And she's like, we're not liberal, we're logical. <laughs> and I was like, I love that. And then I like under, read the, this in the book later and underlined it and like sent it to her. And she was like, I knew I got my degree for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 and it kind of brings that back to connection like i was talking about earlier because one of the things that that lady makes mandatory is she says all of her guards need to have at least two conversations a day with with, yeah. with some of the inmates at least two conversations a day and they were saying like by the you know by the not the end of it because i think they still do it but by the end of it they um we're like having meals with them and like, <laughs> like hanging out, like having actual conversations. And it, it, the whole premise basically of like their, the prison system in Norway is like, how do you expect people to go out into a society when they've been in this place that looks nothing like society, you know? It, and so they had, they had jobs and they made their meals and they talked to each other. The guards were unarmed and you know, they would talk things out and they were like, if you really want them to be reintegrated into society, then you have to like have them in society <laughs> while they're locked up, you know? And one of the reasons it doesn't work for us, oh, this was the thing that I was like, what the heck? I think it was like a quarter of the incarcerated population of the whole entire world are behind American bars. Like we house the most people in prison and jail like 
what the heck? <laughs> yeah, we're the best, you know, like you know, and and it's like yeah. we're spending. We're not the <laughs> yes, and we spent, and like again, it's not that we want to bring it all back to like you know how much things cost, but the reason I am is because it's like that money could go towards UBI, <laughs> you know, like stuff that we actually need, and it's like you could save so much money because it's like not only are we do we have, do we have the most people in prison. We also have the most people that go back to prison once they're released. So it's like this never ending cycle for some people where like they are in and out of prison for like their entire lives. And every time they go back into prison, we are paying for that, you know, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's insane. And they're talking, you know, back kind of what you were talking about, Pastor Steve, is like if people know that this is happening, like, why aren't we doing it? And it's like because they don't talk about it. <laughs> you know, a lot of what's in this book is like stuff that is out there, but it's stuff that not a lot of people know about because it's just not the thing that sticks. No one wants to hear a story about how an inmate grew a garden and made a pot of spaghetti. We want to hear about someone getting shivved in the cafeteria. You know what I mean? Like those are the stories we want to hear. And it's like, uh, you know, the, it's sensationalized and everything in America, I feel like is sensationalized. We're like one big reality show. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I feel, like, really I feel like it's like we do want, but we I think we also do want to hear the positive stories because if you think of like the media, like the news, they will share those crazy stories. But then if you go on like Facebook, I haven't been on Facebook in a long time, but I remember like that for a while that ended up being the thing that I liked about Facebook is like. I would see stuff like, oh, like um, this person is doing a project where they do, where she goes to prisons and the people put on Shakespeare plays. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a real thing. I just don't have the name of the organization down, but I don't know if you've seen that, you know? And so like- the, It was a union. Yeah, so like obviously there's a lot of like bad stuff and negative stuff, negativity shared on social media, like uh, we all know that. Um, <laughs> but it does allow, it's like there's, you don't have that person, you have just regular people sharing what they wanna share. You don't have that producer being like, oh, that, that won't rate, we're not gonna, we're not mm -hmm. gonna share that. Like you have normal people who are gonna share what they wanna share. And you do see the positive stuff too. Um, so yeah, I definitely like that rehabilitation. We need to like, just, we need to just like put incarceration, like we don't need that word anymore. We can just put that to bed. There shouldn't be a reason for it because, you know, like even the people who are locked up for life, like there's people who are locked up for life, well, for stuff that they shouldn't be locked up for life for, but the people who really are like, you know, you really did murder someone in cold blood. Like you really did this absolutely terrible thing and like, it's really, you know, you're probably not going to ever be forgiven for it from your community, you know, from the victim's family and stuff like that. And then they're locked up for life. But then like 40 years later <laughs> are like different people and like <laughs> really, really regret the life that they lived then. And, you know, it's like, OK, at that point, do they deserve to be in a like a, a you know, a solitary confinement type of thing or something like that. So if we, what if we just hold it rehabilitation rates and not incarceration rates? You know, that's kind of where my mind. Turned. Yeah, that was the way the focus was. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, okay. So um, lots of amazing things in that last part of the book. So if you haven't read it, um, do yeah. it. Do it. Yes. <laughs> um, or listen to it if you have Audible. Yes. You I like the narrator? Both. It takes like it. nine hours. So. Yeah. That's like, um, I don't know. If you have a commute, like how many commutes is that? It's like a week of commuting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously not people are commuting right now. My mind just automatically goes there. Some people are, but not yeah. everyone. Um, I want to share one more quote. And then we're going to make our uh, book case for, for humanity. So think about, so essentially, um, the, the bookcase for humanity is just kind of like, how do we take this? I don't know, Megan, you explain it so I can find this quote. <laughs> Essentially, we're making our bookcase, pun intended, for humanity. Um, what about this book uh, can we take with us and apply to our lives? Because what do we say at the Yin Book Club? Knowledge is power but only if that power is turned into action. So you have to go out and do things. So essentially our bookcase for humanity is kind of like a call to action. What about this book helps humanity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that can be a call to action just to yourself, mm -hmm. to the world. Um, 
and that, or it can just be a thought, but that there's something in the thought that involves change. Yes. That's kind of how, cause I think that's kind of like mine. Um, so anyway, so Pastor Steve, do you want to go first or do you want us to go first considering? <laughs> you, yeah, I've, I've got it. I, I put two little quotes together, I guess, that would be my bookcase for humanity. The first is, few ideas have as much power to shape the world as our view of other people because ultimately we get what we expect. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of how I would express this book. How we think about others is what we're going to get. So if we see other people as evil, as um, you know, horrible people that are out to get us, that's what we're going to always see. That's what we're going to get in return, right? So if we if we put people in prison for a lifetime because they're horrible murderers, um, I mean, we'll get them in there for a lifetime. We'll never get to see them again. I don't. Um, it's just we get what we expect. So if you look at people who support another politician as crazy people, um, they'll probably always act crazy in your mind. If you talk to them like a normal person, they might be a normal person. <laughs> you just didn't realize it yet. But the other part, um, he talked about at the end that we need less introspection, more outrospection. Our main task doesn't begin with me, but with us. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me of how we have to be connected. And that's what I love about the Yang Gang. Um, humanity first, right? That's this how we see other people, to treat other people, um, you know, with humanity and to work together to make a difference in the world. I mean, that's what the Yang Gang is to me. I think the fact that we're still doing the Yang Gang book club, that, you know, that we're still um, trending things on Twitter, um, that, that we have these, I still have conversations with people I've never met. Um, I still have a YouTube channel because we're still trying to make these connections. I'm still talking to Trump supporters. I'm still talking to, you know, people I wouldn't necessarily know any other way. I think that's how we make a difference in the world. Yeah. Is together, not just me. Yeah. Our enemies are just like us is the other quote. I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, Megan, you wanna go next? Yeah, so essentially what I took from this is that we just need to be more kind. <laughs> You need to be kind to each other. You know, you talk about uh, the, the ripple effect of kindness. You do something kind for somebody and they do something kind for somebody who does something kind for somebody, you know, and it's just this ripple that you've created um, that, you know, I was talking about this on someone else's uh, podcast the other day, uh, Growth with Tacos. <laughs> and um, essentially I was like, you know, what we really need is a kindness revolution you know, being kind takes courage because we as humans, I think we have this fear of rejection and with kindness brings rejection because someone can reject your kindness. Um, you know, I, you know, I've definitely given a homeless person like all the change I have and they're definitely like, I don't want that. That's all you have. I want more. And it's like, it, that hurts, <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, okay. I did something kind and it's rejected, but you just got to keep doing it because being kind is the most courageous thing you can do. And I think, I think that that really is like a revolutionary thing is being kind. And so I think what I took from this is that even if it's like a one woman revolution, I am going to do it. We are going to have a kindness revolution in 2021. And instead of engaging in divisive behavior, instead of engaging with toxic people who are trying to make things toxic, be kind. And sometimes being kind just means ignoring that and going on with your business. Being kind sometimes means ignoring the drama and focusing on what's important. Being kind means instead of lashing out at people, maybe giving them a compliment instead. <laughs> maybe they're having a hard time. You know, so I, I think being kind is a really a, a radical, a radical thing. So that's that's really what I got out of it. I love that. Another book drop. From Megan. <laughs> kindness revolution is kind of hard to follow. I did find that quote that I was hoping to share. I don't even know if this connects to my um, my my thing, but um, I'm an English major. I can make it connect. <laughs> uh, okay, so this one I like because this is like this is where like the the concept of human kindness gets political. So I just really like this one. Um, for the powerful, for for the powerful, a hopeful view of human nature is downright threatening subversive, seditious. It implies that we're not selfish beasts, 
rights that need to be reined in, restrained, and regulated. It implies that we need a different kind of leadership. A democracy with engaged citizens has no need of career politicians. Um, so yeah, I really like just that idea that like, um, it's this kind of foundation that could cause a revolution because I think people don't like, for instance, we, we usually do this after, but our next book is called Blueprint for Revolution. And it's so funny because I remember Megan was like, oh, there's a book called Blue, Blue, Blueprint for Revolution. I was like, I don't know what having literally the word revolution. And I was kind of like, I don't know, like, is that too much? And then I looked at the cover and it has like a person like all kind of like masked up, not like COVID masked, but like they're like going into a, a smoke bomb or something, you know? And they're like doing this and you think, oh, that's, that looks like they're gonna throw a grenade or something. And it's like a bouquet of flowers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, revolution doesn't have to be something that's like rife with, I mean, at least entirely, right? Entirely about hate and pessimism and you know hardship and you know um it can be something that is like kind and joyous um and that's the thing actually this gets at a quote that i won't bring up or i won't say but it definitely gets at a quote from this is an uprising mm -hmm. which we read in july um where that is the kind of revolution that pe people in power in our society they're not equipped to handle that revolution they have nothing they have nothing to, to do against that that revolution. So um, my bookcase for humanity was trust the power of the people. Go forward in friendship and love. Okay, that does connect. Um, <laughs> That's good. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think um, I think yeah, people power is something that I've been thinking of like put more people power in your life. Like for me even, that's like being really specific with who I follow on social media and like trying to make sure I'm following local businesses in my community, trying to make sure I'm following um, smaller independent publishers, you know, following like native Instagram, native Twitter, you know, following people and, th and that way um, that connect us, especially in this age where we can't really be as connected with our community. And then hopefully mm -hmm. once things open up, like, that's one of my goals is like, I want to find like a local group, uh, like a climate change oriented community in my, in my local neighborhood and connect with those people. And then, you know, if Megan and you, you guys go do something like that, then we can be connected because we're friends from different parts mm -hmm. of, you know, the continent. So, you know, trust that in ourselves that, that like, we can do this. We just have to, we just have to trust each other and obviously like be kind, and, you know, all that, all that good stuff from this book. Yes. So, yay, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> audiobooks are the shit. <laughs> we love audiobooks. Um, so thank you all who, who made it all the way here. We're actually almost at an hour, uh, an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> um, classic. So yeah, um, and so with that, um, Pastor Steve, if you need to go, we're just gonna do some Housekeeping, um, or just stick around. <laughs> Thanks so much for letting me be on. I Absolutely. was just gonna watch, <laughs> but I hopefully I added to the conversation in positive ways. Definitely. <laughs> and you guys do such a great job. Thank you so much for continuing this. I remember I was at the beginning when you guys were talking about doing it, but you didn't just talk about it. You made it happen, and you haven't just made it happen, but you've continued it. And that takes a lot of, I mean, maybe only once a month or whatever, but it takes a lot of work and organization. And it's easy to be overwhelmed when you have other things going on in your life to let this kind of thing drop. So I'm glad you guys have worked together to make it happen. Thank, so thank you. you. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Like, yeah. <laughs> really hard. So we do put a lot of work into it, but it's all 100% worth it um and think and it but it's also like we wouldn't be here if people like you weren't like actually into it so yeah <laughs> we're a book club's gonna change the world you guys we're gonna do this <laughs> well and i just keep on thinking i just feel like i need to mention one more thing if that's okay because mm -hmm. megan uh a while ago probably it's a couple of weeks ago you did this wonderful post that i feel like encompasses sort of what this is about too how you're like i love myself 
I have awesome, I don't remember what y'all said, but but like I have awesome hair, I wear cute outfits, you know, and all this stuff. And you just put that out there. Do you remember this thing? Yeah. Terry, I don't know. Anyway, people yeah. just kept putting it down. And I thought that is what we need. Like um, not only seeing other people in a positive view, but also ourselves. Because I still think back to that post and um, it just made me happy reading how everybody said positive things. Because saying that, even though you might not always feel that way about yourself every day, yeah. um, it can really change your outlook. And I think it can change the outlook for a lot of people. So doing little things like that, doing a positive um, um, little YouTube video, those things really do change lives. Mm -hmm. We just don't always notice it. So Yeah, it makes it okay to do that kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. we talked about mirroring in this conversation. So, you know, just because you're doing it doesn't mean it's like you're making it all about you. You're actually making it Easy. acceptable for other people mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. not themselves. So. Yeah. I think number nine on his list was don't be ashamed to do good and don't be ashamed to think of yourself as good and as other people as, as good too. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good thing to to end with for that conversation. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. But I will get going. I'll let you guys finish up. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Like, oh, okay. That was so nice. Okay. Oh my gosh, there's uh, actually more people on now. How funny. Okay. I know. Uh, <laughs> Hello, guys. Just some housekeeping. Oh, just a quick note. The day that I posted that, I actually was not feeling myself, you guys. <laughs> That's why I posted it. I was like, I'm going to say something positive about myself and I'm just going to believe it. <laughs> I'm just going to believe it's true. Yeah. <laughs> if I say I'm hot, I'm hot. Let's just. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Elizabeth, if you're heading out. I think she did head out. Thank you. Oh man, you guys rock for being here. Uh, yes. I'm gonna throw up some some of your comments. This is from earlier, but just because. This uh, so, I think this has some has been some of the greatest conversation we've had in a while. So if you guys are here, if you're still here listening, thank you so much for commenting. We don't want it to just be us talking about what we think the whole time. We want your input. I know the live stream uh, format is a little like weird trying to discuss a book. Um, but we take your comments like very seriously. We love hearing from you guys. Um, and hopefully within the next few months, we'll have more ways for you guys to participate. So stay tuned for some exciting things we have in store. Um, yeah. So yeah, do not think that we take your participation, 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 <laughs> participation uh, lightly. We, it means a lot to us. Um, so thank you. Um, so let's do some housekeeping real quick. Real quick. Um, if you're here, just stick around for one second. Um, you need to know what the next book is. We have announced it on Twitter, but we just want to say, well, we actually don't have it. The first time in YGBC history that one of us doesn't have the book. Uh, we did, uh, Oh, okay, so it's it's Blueprint for Revolution. Oh wait, we gotta say the subtitle. Yeah, it's a long one uh, by, and so I'm going to probably mess this up. I think it's Serja Popovic or Popovic. Yeah. It's one of those. Okay. Um, fairly certain I'm pronouncing the first name right, and then a little iffy on the last name. Um, but, but exciting thing is, okay. he is the guy who, if you guys read, this is an uprising, Kateri and I could not get enough of Oath War. <laughs> it was like our favorite chapter. I think it's because it was a bunch of university students that started it off. Um, and Serja is, was the founder of Oath War. Um, and so we didn't pick that on purpose. <laughs> I just saw, you know, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do next. And this, that book was on a list and I, you know, we read the subtitle and we read the description and we're like, oh, this is perfect. And then we saw, oh, this is the guy who was the founder of book four um, from This is an Uprising. So that's really exciting. It's the, the subtitle is how to use rice pudding, Lego men and other nonviolent techniques to galvanize communities, overthrow dictators or simply change the world. Yes. Um, so it's it's really exciting. And also accidentally another yellow and gray book cover. <laughs> yeah, another more yellow, more gray. It's funny how that works out. 
Um, so uh, yeah, so really, and then the fact that search can like followed us and liked our announcement and like liked all the tweets to do with it, guys. So we know that this guy is, is a real, yeah. we're not He's partnering not with him like, you yeah. know, like that, it's literally just like goes to show that he's the real deal and he's a really cool person that he like engaged with us on Twitter, like to the extent that he has. And clearly he's glad that we're, that the Yang Gang is reading his book. So we're doing that. And so um, we're going to try to create a space where as much of the Yang Gang as possible can come, can read this book and come together. So we're going to, uh, we can say for sure, we're going to try to have the book to, book discussion have actually a lot more people. I think you're used to seeing mostly us and one or two more people. We wanna, this is the month to really bring as many people on. So if you read it and you're like, hey, I have thoughts guys, DM us, you can, you should come on. Um, I understand sometimes it's a little scary, but like really we're not scary and we're, you know, we're not a big, <laughs> it is on the internet, but like, you know, we all love each other. We're all friends here. Um, so that's the goal is that we ain't getting, we want to create the space for Yang Gang to put to read a book like this that I think is going to be really like it's going to get at the heart of kind of who we are. I have a feeling um, mm -hmm. based on what we know about. Yeah, and if you're not Yang Gang, you're just a lover of books and revolution. <laughs> well, this yeah. is you. Uh, I think we, you know, we touched on in Humankind that we don't need just one. We don't want to be an echo chamber. <laughs> we need we need more conversation. We need. Um, nuanced conversation. So definitely um, you can check us out on Twitter. Got to do all the social media plugs. <laughs> check us out on Twitter at YG Book Club. Um, we do have an Instagram. We're working on streamlining it, uh, but that's Yanking Book Club on Instagram. Um, and we also do a, um, most of you probably know about the giveaway that we do on Twitter, but we also try to do at least one giveaway on Instagram as well. So follow us on Instagram. If you have a Takeover Tuesday you want to do, um, you want to send in some videos of you talking about you know, five or six of your favorite books, um, or if you just have some thoughts or ideas, um, you can send them to our YG Book Club at gmail.com. Um, you can go ahead and send those to us. And also, <laughs> we always forget to do this, but if you guys like what we're doing, please subscribe to our channel <laughs> and like the video. Leave us some comments down below um, so that more people can see what we're trying to do. Um, Help us bring more people into the Yang Gang through books. Yes, the book club, you know, we really do want to be more than just a book club. You know, every time we read a book, we want we want to take what we've learned and put it into action, even if it's just within yourself. Um, so please subscribe, please like the video, leave us a comment, share it with your friends, share the books yeah. with your friends. Um, if there's something that we didn't, sorry, if there's something that we didn't like talk about, cause it's like one of those things where sometimes we get people who reach out and you're like, you didn't talk about this. And I'm like, sorry, we try our best. So that's a, a great opportunity is to like leave a comment on the video and like lay your thoughts out and we will respond to you or we will, you know, maybe share it on Twitter if we can or something. So yeah. There are ways, guys. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Um, leave a comment. Um, we know we try to pick books that aren't too technical, and that most of the time we try to pick books that are easy reads. So, you know, let your friends join in, tell your friends about it. Uh, so, yeah, and we have some exciting things planned for this year. So, <laughs> come along on the ride yeah. with us. 2021, you guys, we're making every moment our moment. <laughs> Definitely making it remote. remote. Okay. So let's say bye and uh, see you guys for a uh, happy hour next in January. Yes. Look out for that. So, we still need to sign off. Yeah. Oh, didn't I say happy, happy reading? reading. Happy reading. Keep yeah, reading. Happy reading. <laughs> bye.